registered, and okay. then we'll get underway. Sounds great. Um, Myla, did you attend the prequel, the previous yes, episode I did. Last, last, last week? Yes, I did. Yep. Great. So you'll see some slides being shuffled in front of you right now. Okay, and I'm moving me. over to last week we had the differential diagnosis. And this week we're going to talk about the diagnostic process, how to use the information from the differential diagnosis talk to make a assessments in behavioral health care, very much oriented to the behavioral health care that's provided in school-based health centers. Um, while we're waiting for a couple other people, Myla, do you have any questions or comments from last week's installment? No. No, but I did go back to the December thing, and I found some handouts that were I thought were great on um, depression and anxiety in kids. Oh, great! And I and I didn't know that I could go back, and I saw that I can also watch some videos. Excellent. That was yeah. I'm well, so excited to go watch some of those. I thank Kevin for that. Um, insofar as He's uh, made this information available to us from what I understand, so thank you, Kevin. I'll go back up here to our beginning. We might as well get underway. I think you know from last week uh, that CMEs or CEUs are available for your attendance today. So I would ask uh, everyone to chime in with any questions along the way as we talk about the diagnostic process in school-based health care behavioral health assessment. And I think you all know me by now, and we were just talking about how last week we had the presentation on differential diagnosis which is a more content-laden presentation because there's so much information about the various major diagnostic domains to consider during behavioral health assessment. Today we're going to look at how differential diagnostic considerations um, are used to make diagnoses in behavioral health. Um, that is, how to use that information from last week and emphasizing more of the process of how we do that. At the end of today's uh, PowerPoint are the uh, references for both parts. So a bit of summary from last week and for the benefit of McCain as well, who was not with us last week, Students referred specifically for evaluations of ADHD frequently have other often coexisting conditions that impair their learning. There are various diagnostic domains that feature the hallmarks of ADHD, and hence we talked about the differential diagnosis of that, and that comorbid considerations or comorbid disorders and exacerbating factors need to be considered because they contribute to the clinical picture that often looks like ADHD. And I talk about ADHD last week and this week because that's where it really began for me in my clinical work, receiving referrals of students being asked to diagnose ADHD and prescribe medication. But numerous psychiatric problems in youth feature these hallmarks, if you will, of ADHD, and concentration difficulties are symptomatic of virtually every psychiatric disorder. All the diagnoses that are listed in the DSM, as well as many related 
subsyndromal conditions for which we would not give a diagnosis. So our goal today in the diagnostic process is to consider these major diagnostic domains while incorporating the clinical information that's been received to obtain, a, to make a diagnosis, okay? To use the information obtained during a comprehensive assessment to make the diagnosis. Well, how are behavioral health diagnoses made? And how can we diagnose in school-based health care? What is considered when making diagnoses? Well, to answer these questions, we're going to describe three main phases of behavioral health assessment process in school-based health centers, construct biopsychosocial assessments of students' behavioral health problems, and follow behavioral health care assessment standards. So we receive a referral from the school, and please note this is for example only to make the point, a referral that came up last week. Um, Milo, when you were on, you saw this, this uh, referral of a third grade boy named Spivey. And the referral asked yeah. for an ADHD diagnosis and a prescription for Ritalin. And I commented at the time that sometimes the referrals might even say, diagnose ADHD and prescribe Ritalin. And that's not to make any kind of commentary or judgment about school educators um, or teams, but that sometimes the referrals are very specific. But does the referral make the diagnosis and prescribe the treatment is the rhetorical question for the series. Incomplete command. Begin with the star key and end with the pound key. That's right. The referral is an incomplete command. <laughs> it would be incomplete to utilize the referral to make the diagnosis and prescribe treatment. How timely was that? Well, we need to consider diagnostic possibilities. We need more information. Well, where do we go for that information? How do we find it? From who and where do we find it? Well, there's our team conference, which can be a gold mine. And so can discussions with various people who work with the student elsewhere in the school. And I'm adding on something that you're not seeing in your handout, Milo, which is student screening. And this is something that we do very well in school-based health centers that's a very important part of what we're doing today. So these are going to be two main sources. And again, there's really the third, which is to go to each of the school personnel individually, but we can invite them to the team conference to discuss this student. So we ask the teacher, what's seen in class that suggests ADHD? And the teacher describes, well, Spivey doesn't pay attention and he doesn't listen. His assignments are incomplete and they're often not turned in. That's important. Seems like he's somewhere else. Well, is he impulsive? That is, does he act before thinking? Well, sometimes he does. And at times he doesn't follow rules and directives. Well, is Spivey hyperactive? Well, today, no, not really. But yesterday he was, so it's, he's intermittently hyperactive. That's important. Is he aggressive? Well, he's aggressive toward his teacher, other adults and peers, and he's physically aggressive with peers. Well, is he moody or irritable? He's easily annoyed and frustrated. Um, has the parent been notified? Now can't reach mom and the family. So fortunately, the school counselor is at our team conference uh, at this time, 
and reports poor academics and some behavioral problems this year uh, while retained in the third grade. Had many absences the previous two years. And he's had recent referrals for aggression. Again, the, the verbal aggression toward teachers, other adults, as well as physical and verbal aggression with peers. He's often teased and bullied by peers, and he's being tested for special ed, another gold mine. Well, what's going on at home? Hard to reach mom, and we understand it's chaotic at home. So Myla is at the team conference today. And Myla, what can you tell us about Spivey? Well, he's been, you've noticed he's had a lot of digestive tract and headache complaints the last two years, among other somatic complaints, of which there are many. However, his annual health screen and physical exam the past two years have essentially been normal, except for the fact that he's overweight. He has frequent visits this year for vague complaints and unclear reasons. He appears sad and needy. Myla, does that remind you of any students you've worked with? Yes, it does. So the educational diagnostician is at our team conference today. The psychoeducational evaluation is in progress, and thus far the cognitive testing that's being done with the WISC has revealed deficient verbal intelligence and low average nonverbal intelligence. However, the full-scale IQ can't be interpreted due to the disparity between those two parameters. He's observed to have slow language processing and intermittent distractibility. No evident vision or hearing deficits is what the educational diagnostician has learned from Myla. Um, his performance testing is pending. So we have his cognitive testing to get an idea of his cognitive ability, but we don't have what his current academic performance is on a standardized test. And he's been referred for a speech and language evaluation due to the problems with language uh, and uh, ver verbal communication. Well, based on what we've been talking about, does Spivey have ADHD? If so, which type? What is the evidence for? What is the evidence against? Well, clues include age of onset, variable features, those have been alluded to along the way, etc. Well, now we embark on a series of some pretty dense slides. There are a few of them here just a heads up, so please hang in there with me. This ADHD evaluation described here makes the point that students are not tested for ADHD. ADHD is a clinical diagnosis made by comprehensive assessment. Uh, from uh, reports of behavior in multiple settings, so it's really hard to make a valid diagnosis of ADHD in a single clinic visit or based on a single classroom uh, behavioral rating or a rating of behaviors and issues at home. I emphasize again no specific or single diagnostic test for ADHD because often people talk about ADHD as something that can be tested. Uh, parents will often say they want to have an evaluation to have their son or daughter tested for ADHD. And often students are referred for neuropsychological and other testing to diagnose ADHD. And that's really not the 
most useful route to go. Um, a neuropsychological and other psychological testing can support an ADHD diagnosis and reveal coexisting learning language and other problems, but it's not a test for ADHD. Next dense slide makes the point that there are various rating scales and inventories that can be used in the assessment of ADHD and other clinical conditions. The Connors, the first one, was really set up for the, the assessment of ADHD. The Vanderbilt, also known as the NICHQ, is also sponsored by the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's really an assessment instrument for ADHD and other disruptive behaviors. It also screens for indicators of depression and anxiety, which makes it a very handy tool. Many primary care providers have found it quite handy. The actors, known as the ADD-H or ADD, Comprehensive Teacher's Rating Scale, is an older scale, very user-friendly, handy because it allows graphing of the data and helpful for monitoring progress over time. The Achenbach is a standard clinical instrument that, that, is, uh, that gathers a lot of information across various diagnostic domains for youth. And it can be very handy because there's software available for processing the data and showing a lot of information such as uh, the, the proportion of internalizing versus externalizing behaviors. That would be, for example, depression and anxiety versus oppositional defiant disorder. And the BASC is also very popular. So I just want to mention those because these are so handy in supporting what was just mentioned in the last slide at the very top, the comprehensive assessment for ADHD and other conditions really benefits from the information that can be obtained from these assessment instruments. So I wanted to include those just to go over them with you because the diagnostic hallmarks of ADHD listed here, distractibility, impulsivity, and hyperactivity, can be present in any of these diagnostic domains, okay? Whether it's ADHD, other disruptive behaviors, the mood disorders, psychotic disorders, anxiety disorders, all the way down the line that we talked about last week. Last week, we also talked about how coexisting disorders are so important because clinical assessment often reveals more than one disorder. ADHD itself is really a condition of comorbidity, okay? Two-thirds to three-quarters of youth with ADHD have at least one other disorder, and oppositional defiant disorder is probably the most common among them. It's also very important because disorders that can mimic ADHD often coexist with ADHD, such as depression, PTSD, and other anxiety disorders. Often, there may not even be ADHD in the picture, but the combination of depression, anxiety, and disruptive behavior disorders, such as dysthymia, PTSD, conduct disorder, and a traumatic brain injury, a neuropsych condition, together can add up to look a lot like ADHD. Well, I mentioned earlier that not only do we have our team conferencing to bring all that rich information to incorporate into the clinical assessment from the teacher, the counselor, Myla as the school nurse, educational diagnostician, okay? Um, we also have school-based health center screening, which is done for depression, 
and anxiety in the SHQ, the Student Health Questionnaire. There are two items for each depression and anxiety. The two items for depression, known as the PHQ-2. If either of those items are positive, it indicates beginning an assessment using the PHQ-9 modified for teens, which is an assessment instrument. Likewise, a positive response to either of the two anxiety screening items, one for the psychological correlates of, of anxiety, the other being the somatic correlates of anxiety, would indicate beginning the assessment using the SCARED. Well, here's what we find out by going ahead and doing those indicated assessments. On the PHQ-9, Spivey scored a 19, which according to the point scale is at the very highest part of the moderately severe depression category. Just a point below severe depression. And on the scared, the total score is significant for anxiety. And most of the subscales have scores of significance in realms of panic and somatic, generalized anxiety, separation anxiety, and school avoidance. Well, last week we talked about the biopsychosocial model as something very useful initially to describe heart disease, other medical conditions, now very applicable to psychiatric disorders. It explains etiology by describing biologic correlates such as genetic predisposition and constitutional aspects and psychological experiences along with social and environmental factors. So when we apply the bi biopsychosocial model, we identify through exploration during the evaluation from interview and the collateral sources mentioned earlier, whether there are the biologic factors, uh, whether these are genetic, physiologic factors, and these are suggested by the family history, the past psychiatric history, and the past medical history, and psychological issues that can be developmental, family, individual, psychodynamic. And then there are the social situations and stressors that also contribute. Well, we can revisit what we talked about last week in this regard with psychosocial factors listed here because it's axis four. Spivey has a chronically ill parent and other caregivers and family members. With medical conditions, we can see that in somebody like Spivey that hypothyroidism, even very slight hypothyroidism, or overweight could contribute to the picture. Well, we're not necessarily trying to find one condition versus another that will explain all of what's going on with Spivey. And it reminds me of this quote from a favorite novel, Moby Dick. The whale therefore must see one distinct picture on this side and another distinct picture on that side, while all between must be profound darkness and nothingness. Well, this is a very interesting passage from the standpoint of intellectual history based on the physics that was going on at the time. This is when light was being studied and found to have both a wave and a particle characteristic. And many were trying to explain if it was one or another and not yet being able to get to the point of describing it being both and how it can be both. And as clinicians and as teams, we can evolve to have binocular versus monocular vision and be able to see the depth of the surroundings as our clinical situations. 
And this can get into the clinical epistemology, not only of individual medical and behavioral health providers, but as teams as well, as teams evolve to develop the binocular vision. Because it's long been known, traditionally speaking, that ways of understanding and performing clinical practice have differed between medical and behavioral health providers who have different approaches, methods, rates, specificity, certainty, and thought processes about their clinical work. This affects making assessments, providing treatment, conceptualizing student conditions and needs. And that one of the great assets of school-based health centers are how their providers practicing in teams have bridged these differences to ultimately integrate medical and behavioral health care for students, i.e. developing binocular vision. Well, what does this mean in terms of our evaluation of SPIVI? And this is where I find it hard to remain seated. I feel a bit like the the, the weather dude on the news, because we definitely have a upper atmosphere disturbance going on here with a lot of problems. Can you hear me, Myla? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Because Spivey, and, and in the, um, the PowerPoint, the significant findings are in red. As we summarize Spivey's history insofar as he's a 10-year-old multiracial male in the custody of a single mom, and it turns out she receives SSI for a psychiatric disability. She's had a chronic mental illness prompting repeated hospitalizations. Spivey has never himself received mental health care. He has had a history of physical abuse and much witness violence in a chaotic home. Those are factors that can contribute to PTSD. His academic decline has been associated with frequent inattention and not being able to remain on task, plus episodic hyperactivity and impulsivity. That is not persistent hyperactivity and impulsivity, and that this has really become significant this school year. He sometimes doesn't follow directives. Um, he has occasional anger discontrol in school and at home with impulsive aggression toward adults, that is verbal, and physical and verbal aggression toward peers. As we found out at the outset, He's been retained in the third grade following repeated school refusal associated with numerous somatic complaints, especially digestive tract and headaches, such as stomach aches and headaches, during the last two years. And it turns out his older brother has been in the county detention center on murder charges since his arrest at home this past August. So here's Spivey. 10 years old, being retained in third grade, and just as he's starting to repeat third grade, he witnesses his brother being arrested at home by the county uh, deputies on murder charges. So Spivey's really having a hard year, and this is when he's been having more problems with what can appear like ADHD but it's not a persistent hyperactivity and impulsivity. He does have more persistent focusing difficulties. And this is what's seen in the classroom, for example. Frequently, his focus and task persistence, it turns out, are frequently interrupted by distressing memories and flashbacks. As we talked about last week, that's characteristic of PTSD. He also has insomnia. So the onset delay is more characteristic of an anxiety disorder such as PTSD. 
and the intermittent and early morning awakenings more characteristic of depression. Diminished appetite with sporadic eating, he doesn't eat breakfast, and usually he's very tired except for restless moments associated with apprehension, dread, anxiety, and fear. Again, very typical of an anxiety disorder like PTSD. Well, what we find on mental status exam is that his hygiene is fair, he's really not groomed, hypervigilant, looking around a lot, startles at the blare of the school's morning announcements. Well, some of us have been known to do that but on occasion, but he does that a lot. He has less than age-appropriate relatedness, that is, he relates like a younger child, uh, probably due to some regression, which is a developmental phenomena and, and can be psychologically defensive. His eye contact is intermittent. He really doesn't uh, interact and uh, initiate contact and elaborate in a spontaneous way. When asked questions, there's a long delay in his responses. Um, he has difficulty understanding questions and stating answers, yet he can articulate words well. So that's characteristic of a language problem, and the delay in response evident, evidences perhaps an auditory processing problem or other cause of a receptive or receptive and expressive language problem. Evidence psychomotor slowing, typical of depression during much of the interview, and he becomes restless and agitated when traumatic past is discussed. That's characteristic of PTSD. He mostly attends to the interview, but is often distracted. Okay? He becomes downcast and shut down and tearful when interviewed about family. More characteristic of depression. He appears pensive, worried, and dysphoric. Anxiety uh, along with depression. His affect is restricted. His thought content is predominantly negative and hopeless, as in depression, with a foreshortened sense of future, typical of PTSD, oblique references to death, typical of a major depressive episode. Thought processes are logical and mostly linear. No evidence of hallucinations. He has little insight, especially about his impulsive, reactive aggression. He doesn't understand why he becomes impulsively aggressive during some interactions, which could have to do with PTSD as well as perhaps attachment problems. Well, the classroom ratings done with perhaps a Vanderbilt or a Connors or an Actors reveals hyperactivity, impulsivity, and distractibility as well as oppositionality that vary across classrooms and times of day. That's more typical of something other than ADHD, which tends to be more persistent and pervasive pretty much continuing over time and across different settings. His is more variable. Mom reports these are infrequent sporadic problems at home, tending to occur mostly during family conflict and turmoil, such as getting activated due to po a post-traumatic state. That's when Spivey becomes aggressive. Cognitive testing, we talked about the deficient verbal intelligence and low average nonverbal intelligence, as well as slow verbal, that is, language processing. On physical exam, his BMI is 96% for his age. And on his lab tests, the only thing that's really remarkable are his thyroid function tests. And what you're going to hear me say as a psychiatrist would be said or of a different level of concern by an endocrinologist. For me as a psychiatrist, a TSH of 6.8 is 
pretty significant and concerning. Even though the free T4, the actual thyroxine or thyroid hormone, is just a little low. I'm not talking about the concern about a really big hypothyroidism, but just a little bit that seems to make the depression worse. So we're putting all this together, a lot of things to consider, and more than I would expect us to have to consider in most circumstances. Thanks, I got it, Kevin. So the likely diagnoses for spivy include double depression with features of dysthymic disorder as well as major depressive episode, post-traumatic stress disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, a lot of anger, um, a lot of negativity and hostility, and evolving conduct disorder features that can add to that aggression, so can PTSD, so can a reactive attachment disorder or reactive attachment problems. Growing up in a chaotic home where mom has mental illness, may have been a substance abuser as well, perhaps not, most likely not having consistent availability of mom and other caregivers, probably various shifting caregivers. Receptive expressive language disorder is provisional pending a speech and language evaluation. And I just added on the possibility of this more complicated entity discussed last week, mild neurocognitive disorder, which can pull together many of these concerns with language, learning, um, memory, and executive functioning difficulties, an important neuropsych consideration. Access to uh, deficient verbal intelligence would not diagnose mental retardation. Axis 3, the medical conditions, obesity, that is due to a BMI above the 95th percentile, and mild hypothyroidism. While no medical causes are found for uh, tummy aches and headaches. And again, I'll emphasize that the hypothyroidism, as mild as it may be, ends up being a factor along with obesity and making both of them really making depression worse. A lot of comorbidity there. Um, access for the psychosocial stressors, um, insufficient primary supports, educational, social, and family problems, Having a single mom with chronic mental illness alone is a huge psychosocial stressor. Well, that's the description of so many things going on with Spivey and as an example of how to apply the information about differential diagnosis to a case. And again, this case is purposely highly complex and multifactorial uh, for purposes of discussion and illustration. Um, I was wondering if anybody has any questions or points that you'd like to make about this case or anything thus discussed today. I have a question, Dan. Yes. Um, in your experience, I, I understand the need to kind of get everybody who has interaction with the kid to get together. How easy do you think that is in a, you know, coming from a school-based health center to get the, the school staff involved? Well, that's, that's a great question. And it, it varies from site to site. Um, there are some school settings that have a great tendency to do that. And they will immediately start doing that at the beginning of the school year when they notice the school-based health center providers are there. They will 
get together, that is the school providers with the school-based health center providers. Um, Myla, the school counselor, the school social worker, um, sometimes the educational diagnostician, people who were uh, uh, accessed today along with the school-based health center providers. Um, in some sites, it can be so much in the opposite direction, where it's very, very difficult to get everybody together. And, and the next best thing is to go around to each of them individually, or in some way solicit their input. And I wanted to ask as well, did somebody else join us a little bit late today? Anyone join us who hasn't announced themselves? Um, Myla, are you still there? Yes, I am. And do we have Sandra on the line? And by chance, do we have Pat on the line? Dr. C. DeBaca. Well, I'm been eager to ask if nobody else has um, concerns, questions about Spivey. Does anyone have another case? Myla, anybody come into your school nurse's office that are presenting concerning behaviors or uh, symptoms? We have a lot of kids that come in with stomach aches. And so that's hard yeah. to know if, it, if it's really a stomach ache, is it anxiety? And we do have one one child who used to come in a lot, not so much right now because the teacher won't let him come. And she would make the comment in front of the other kids that he just, well, he does have a diagnosis of ADHD, and he comes in with um, headaches and stomach aches and just kind of vague complaints. And he's on medication at home. It's kind of hard to know what to do with that. Do I, you know, like tough love, go back to class? Do I say go ahead and rest here for a few minutes? I know you're having a hard time. So I don't know what I should be doing in that case. Well, uh, what the usual recommendation on that based on, it's really based more on the studies and literature about adults more than pediatric population, is to continue to be an empathic, supportive listener, to uh -huh. allow a reasonable amount of time for that mm -hmm. empathic listening, um, set limits, and redirect to class. Do you know that who made very the... Sorry, I just had a question. Do you know who made the diagnosis of ADHD? I believe it was a psychiatrist. And also, so it's ADHD and I do believe anxiety. And while my wife, 
very much believe it, it's the onus is not on you to ferret all, out everything that's going on with this student. Um, I do think that the more you're thinking about the possibilities, um, the more it can help this student, even if it's by way of your ongoing conversation with the psychiatric provider, other providers, and or the parent. You know, when, whenever we encounter a student who's taking psychostimulant medication for a diagnosis of ADHD and they seem anxious, we have to wonder, did the anxiety necessarily proceed, precede the uh, psychostimulant medication? Or could the student be anxious because of the psychostimulant medication? That's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. And yet, at the same time, I don't think the onus needs to be on you to find out that answer, but to um, share the concern with the parent and uh, recommend that the parent discuss that with the psychiatric provider. Okay. Well, Myla, I would like you and other school providers to know that the telepsychiatry consultation that I make available to school-based health center providers, I would also make available to you and your team. Um, for ease of scheduling and remembering, it's currently four afternoons a week, 2 to 3 p.m. Um, that is before webinar time. So there's some contact information. And here are some references. By the way, when noticing the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, fourth edition, the DSM-4, I'm reminded that while the diagnoses were listed along these various axes today, um, this may be the last time that's done in a webinar here um, because the so-called multi-axial diagnostic system is going to go away um, with the advent of DSM-5. Well, Kevin, I think we can uh, count Myla in on our roll call. I've got you in, Myla. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks for attending today, Myla. Thank you very much for having me again, and I will be back probably next week. Well, that sounds great. I'll tell you, for, for this series, we currently do not have uh, an installment scheduled for next week, but we okay. will in the near future. Okay. And yes. I can tell you that future topics uh, will include uh, behavioral health treatment approaches, as well as youth substance abuse. Well, that all well, look, great. Thank look you. Look forward to you being back. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.